Vanessa Clark. Please call me Dr. Mel. And you know, we are here each and every week doing what we do on Excuse Me Doctor, which is bringing you the information that you need to make wise health decisions, not just for yourself, but for your family and for your community. So thank you so much for tuning in on any of our platforms, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, or Sirius HUR XM, HUR Voices, uh, Sirius XM 141. We'll get that right. So if you're newbies and you're tuning in for the first time, if you're on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. And if you are on Facebook, we would love, love, love if you hit that like button. And of course, please remember to put your questions in the chat because that is why we are here to make sure that we answer what's on your mind. Now, let us get into creating an amazing week for ourselves with all the health topics we are going to cover. And you know, if you have watched the show before, that I must have my two incredible co-hosts to join me in doing that. So I welcome and bring to the virtual stage, Mr. Wayne Bruce and Miss Bria Good. Howdy, hey. howdy. Hey. Howdy, howdy. Studio's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Studio is on fire. Man. Dr. We coming wow. back here to talk about coming here to talk about health after we didn't eat all that good food for Thanksgiving. I, I'm telling you, I mean, we are in this holiday season and you know it's gonna be like parties and food and eggnog and all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff. So hey. Everything is happening. Yeah. Mike straight here, Dr. Mel. Wow. People wow. say they heard breathing earlier. I don't know what <laughs> uh -oh. they're talking about. <laughs> uh oh. Well, your shirt looks good. I, I like the shirt. You like I mean. the shirt? I'm yeah, I like the get, shirt. My camera is shirt. messing up, so they can't see the shirt all the way. Oh, okay. But all by right. the time we good. get back on back on with the questions, my shirt is gonna be I won't be, be, be tight. Okay. Be tight. All right, cool. I got cool. I gotta do some rebuilding, y'all, in the studio. So <laughs> All right. Well, um, how did maybe while everybody... you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, y'all. So, um, we have we have something we're talking about today, right? <laughs> Bria, what what's going on? <laughs> what you mean? What are we talking about? Are we talking about the tox the toxic things are in, in the items that we use, right, Doctor Mel? You got it. Yes. Um, there are literally thousands of products that uh, have health destroying chemicals in them that we are exposed to. We expose ourselves voluntarily, but often unknowingly. And you know what? A lot, a lot of times these products are marketed specifically and over marketed to who? Communities of color. So of we're not into... Right, of course, black and brown people. So, you know, we're not into being victims here at, excuse me, doctor. All you in the Be Health Empowered family know that we are here to help provide solutions. So we're going to be talking about what is making us toxic and what we can do about it. And we have an incredible mm -hmm. guest from an organization called the Environmental Working Group or EWG. I'm like a fangirl of this organization. <laughs> I go there every week to like see what they post about what kinds of things we should be focused on around our health and bring them to you. So like the last couple of weeks we were talking about um, the dirty dozen in terms of foods that you should buy organic versus the mm -hmm. safe 15, those things that you, um, you know, can get away with not buying organic. That information came from the environmental environmental working group or EWG. So we are really delighted to have, they're senior scientists here with us today. It's gonna be right. it's gonna be off the chain. It's gonna be off the chain. Great. We're gonna find out what's going on for Christmas, what you should and should not <laughs> buy on your list. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Because you don't want to give your loved ones toxic chemicals for Christmas. That's <laughs> so. not chain. that's not fun. <laughs> I feel like right. that's worse than coal. <laughs> yeah, right. That's pretty bad. So make sure that you share, share, share this right now. Drop what you're doing with anybody who's making their Christmas list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Anybody who wants to improve their health, um, you know, or concern, concerned about their hormones, their thyroid hormones, their sex hormones, whatever. 
um, because all these things disrupt our hormone systems. So Everybody's concerned about their sex hormones. I'm sorry. There you go. Everybody. Right. <laughs> so that there you go. Share with everybody. Share with everybody. So let's get into it. Let's go to the recap, y'all. Let's get it. Here we go. So, <laughs> Dr. Mel. Yes. We're in a triple demic. What's up with the COVID update? We in a triple demic. This is called a triple demic now. Mm. Yeah, that's because it's not just COVID on the scene, but it's RSV, which we know is hitting um, kids a whole lot. I mean, mm -hmm. hospitals are running out of space and supplies because of just the, uh, you know, incredible number of children that are coming down with RSV. And then, of course, it's flu season. So mm -hmm. all three of these viruses are conspiring together to really hit healthcare workers hard and make it so that they're long waits when you go to the hospital, et cetera. Now, if you have to go to the hospital, of course you should go. But if it's something that you could deal with, with your primary care or in an urgent care, I would try that route first. Okay. Oh man, I swear. Every year it's so like, look, it's, look, it's worse. <laughs> yeah, look, right. let's talk about this past weekend, we went shopping. Oh, Lord. Dr. Mel and I went shopping looking for a bed. And the dude, and our salesman had can was a cancer. He was going through treatment. Right. And he had no mask on. I have no idea what he was thinking. None. I mean, even if, okay... He was like, maybe he just had COVID last week or something. It's still RSV and the flu out here. So I am really suggesting that, you know, as far as indoor masking, especially if you're elderly or your immune system is low, wear a mask. It ain't going to hurt nothing. It will help. Um, and, you know, it will also help you from spreading it to other people if you don't get it. So I have gone back to wearing my mask indoors right after I got boosted, which was in early November. I kind of like, you know, slacked off a little bit. I ain't gonna lie. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> but um, I am back now and better than ever with my mask because it's just not worth it to me to get sick around the holidays. It's just too much fun to be had and too much things to do. Too much, too much, mm -hmm. too, much. too much. And I'm on my multivitamins. I'm taking my vitamin mm -hmm. D. I'm mm -hmm. up in my fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. at seven servings a day. I am winterizing my Come body on. in addition to the booster and the flu shot that I got. Come on with the renterizer. Yep. Come on. You're doing everything that you can. Oddly enough, that scenario doesn't surprise me. People haven't cared since March 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's more than ever now that people are without their masks. So. And not, mm -hmm. not really taking precautions. Yeah. So speaking of COVID, what's the COVID, um, what's the supplement that cuts COVID risk? So I know there's so many unproven remedies, medicines, all of that, but what's actually proven to cut COVID risk? Right. You know, just tonight, somebody who's in healthcare asked me about ivermectin. That is not the one that is proven to cut COVID risk. Ivermectin doesn't work. Bleach doesn't work. Hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. <laughs> um, those special lights, you know, standing under it doesn't work. But there is one thing that a recent study has proven helps. And that's the one thing that I just mentioned, which is vitamin D, vitamin D3 Ooh. specifically. Yep. So compared to those people who didn't take vitamin D, those who did, um, uh, decrease their infection risk by 20 to 30 percent mm. just by having normal vitamin D levels. Um, and it also, if you did get COVID and your vitamin D levels were normal, there was a correlation with 33 percent less lower risk of death. So that's huge. Oh, wow. that's it was huge. simple simple intervention. I'm not suggesting, of course, that this substitute for vaccination. All these things work together. Like I talk about when you go out into a snowstorm, you want multiple layers. So mm -hmm. imagine we are in a triple demic <laughs> snowstorm and you want <laughs> not just your undershirt and your um, sweater 
uh, and your parka and your down coat and your hat, you want them all on together. And so right. the vitamin D adds to this list of things that you can wear to, uh, to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel like we keep coming back to vitamin D. Like, I feel like we've talked about it pretty frequently every week. Like y'all, y'all need to get on this vitamin D. <laughs> right. But actually this is the first study that actually shows it's protective. Wow. wow. Yeah. You were so ahead of research. You were ahead of the game, Dr. Mel. Well, it's, it, 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 Low vitamin D levels are correlated with so many things that we know of falls in the elderly, higher risk for diabetes, cancer, mm -hmm. obesity, on down the line. And we know that black people and pe people with pigment in their skin have lower levels of vitamin D because you get it from sunlight. Mm -hmm. So um, and the melanin helps, you know, it blocks the absorption of vitamin D. So people with darker skin have to be particularly focused on their vitamin D level especially in the winter when you get out less. Mm -hmm. Can't be caught slacking in the winter with this COVID. Right. Triple demic. Yeah. There you go. Triple demic. So all you people who, who uh, you know, can take, can take that to help you out. That's the one supplement that you can take to help right. you. Right. Mm -hmm. And get your blood level tested by your doctor so you know exactly how much to take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Mel, I'm not a morning person. I'm just not a morning person. <laughs> I don't like to do a whole lot in the morning. But I might have to start being a morning person because, you know, to get my workout set. Get strong, right. You know. Right. And you would be wise to do that because, again, there was a study published just this week about whether morning exercise is better. And guess what? It what turns out it is. It, it turns wow. out it is. Yeah. So it doesn't matter even regardless of how much exercise you get in, if you actually get it in in the morning, it actually is correlated with more protection against cardiovascular disease, which means heart attacks and strokes. Mm -hmm. So of course, getting it in is the most important thing. Um, but if you have a choice, be the early bird and get it in in the morning because over the long haul, it'll be more protective for your heart and your, and your brain. So, if, does that mean you have to do a whole lot of it in the morning or what? Yeah, no, I mean, the recommended amount is 30 minutes a day. And, you know, you can break that up. You could do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes at night, uh, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. But as long as you get it in, that's the most important thing. And get some of it in in the morning would be great. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I just did my morning workout today okay. and that made me feel a lot better <laughs> about yeah it energizes morning. you it really you does i started morning, Bri? uh look i normally do the evenings i tried the mornings this time and i was tired i won't lie to you i was tired at work but it does help okay. you get a little bit a little burst of energy in, in the, the morning beginning. with your in coffee the morning. with your caffeine with the coffee <laughs> right and then if you you gotta replace replace the sweat so you gotta drink water too because that will might help take care of that little tiredness that you felt in the afternoon. So stay hydrated. Definitely got to drink my water and not drink alcohol because um, apparently alcohol is causing problems for young people. And, you know, we think we invincible. We think we can take on anything. So it's a holiday yeah. season and it, there's a lot of gatherings, a lot of associations, a lot of alcohol and things going on. So what's going on with this? Yeah. So we now know that for young people aged 20 to 49, that one out of every five deaths in that age group is related to alcohol. And, oh, wow. and it looks like those numbers were from uh, 2015 through 2019. It looks like they've gotten worse, of course, during the pandemic because more people started drinking because they were staying home and they were isolated. So uh, during the pandemic, um, so some of those deaths were 100% due to alcohol, like alcohol poisoning or, you know, damage to the liver from a lot of drinking over time. And then some of them were partially related to alcohol, for example, like injuries um, from car accidents mm -hmm. or falls. Um, so, of course, policies would help to decrease this premature death rate from alcohol by policies. I mean, like you know, when you go into when you go into the hood and you see the high concentration of liquor stores, zoning can help mm -hmm. that by cutting back on the number of liquor stores that are in a neighborhood. 
um, or putting higher taxes on alcohol to dis, you know, discourage, you know, buying a lot. Um, but it's also really important to be able to recognize the signs of alcohol use disorder in yourself or in your loved ones. So I'm going to run mm -hmm. down a couple of them. One is any pattern of alcohol use that involves problems controlling your drinking or being preoccupied with alcohol or continuing to use alcohol, even when it causes you problems in your life and your functioning. Um, the other is it, if, if it involves having to drink more and more and more over time to feel the same way and get the same effect, that's a, that's a red flag. Another red flag mm -hmm. is if you start having withdrawal symptoms uh, when mm. you, you know, decrease and, you know, withdrawal symptoms, having, you know, tremors and shakes. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of them. And then the last thing is binge drinking. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I don't have a problem with alcohol. I only drink on the weekend. Well, how much do you drink? I drink three 12 packs. You know, that's a problem. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anytime a man has five or more drinks and a woman within two hours or a woman has at least four drinks within two hours, that's been drink binge drinking. And mm -hmm. that can cause significant health and safety risks. So if any of those things are going on with you or loved ones, they're too talk to your doctor, but there are also two immediate options you can take. One is find Alcoholics Anonymous near you. So that's aa.org. Very simple. Or you can call 988. That's the new crisis service hotline mm -hmm. where you can get help and get referred to an alcohol treatment program. Wow. That's sad. We have one mm -hmm. of the comments uh, from Maria Sindo says, alcoholics will find alcohol even if they have to drink antifreeze. Yes, and that's which is deadly. Which antifreeze is deadly. kills you. It, give, it gets you high immediately, but it's, it's fatal. And, and I have taken mm -hmm. care of people who have died from antifreeze poisoning. Mm -hmm. So she's exa exactly right. Thank you for sharing that, Maria. Wow. So... I guess we have to move on. We lost Brie. Oh, no. Oh, I'm here. She ain't going nowhere. Okay. You did internet, Brie? Internet, hic internet hookup. hiccup. I'm, a, I'm alive. The alcohol, got, the alcohol information got me in my file. I'm so surprised. I had to log off and log back in. <laughs> Uh-oh. That microphone is a little different. But we'll get to it. We're going to go where? Where are we going? What, what time is it? We need a the weekly debunk. Well, that one was a little slow. <laughs> All right, so we're here with Tiana Twitter fingers, and hopefully you all can hear me okay. But she texted me, called me, all those things today, and was talking about. I saw a TikTok video on reasons not to expose my baby to the measles vaccine. After all, ain't no measles outbreaks anyway. Um, right what you say? You probably said, I don't know about that. Excuse me, Dr. Mel, is that true? Well, uh, no, there are measles outbreaks going on, and there is a reason to get the measles vaccine or, or make sure that your child is vaccinated against measles. So in 2019, the United States experienced the greatest number of measles cases reported since the disease was eliminated from this country in 2000. Let's be clear how it was eliminated. It was eliminated vaccination. Um, and an outbreak is anything more than three cases. So right now, even as we speak in Columbus, Ohio, and shout out to my fam in Columbus, Ohio, but they are having a measles outbreak there right now. There are 21 children, all under four years old, um, who now have measles. And unfortunately, none of them are vaccinated. And Measles is super, super contagious. Nine in 10 people who are exposed to it and are not vaccinated will get it. And it can be miserable. Mm. Fevers, cough, runny nose, watery eyes, and a red rash are the hallmarks of measles. But in one in five people, it can actually lead to pneumonia, brain inflammation, and even death. So it's nothing to play with. Um, now, the reason that measles outbreaks are rare in the United States is because communities with vaccination rates over 90 percent. So you've heard mm -hmm. of herd immunity. That's what right. that means. Mm -hmm. It protects, it kind of stops the spread. So it's almost like having a firewall. Right. 
because it has nowhere to spread if a bunch of people in the community are vaccinated. Um, and that protects infants who aren't old enough to get it because you have to be a year old to get your first dose. And it, in, it protects people who can't get vaccinated because they're immune compromised. So, and that, that's only true for measles, by the way, uh, because it's, it's a live vaccine with, that's weakened. So people with weakened immune systems shouldn't get it. So when your local immunization rate dips below that 90%, that's when the outbreaks happen. Okay. Um, so it's 97% effective. Uh, it's safe. Um, and if your baby is eligible for the vaccine, please get it. Let mm -hmm. them get it. It's, it protects them and it protects all of us. Go get it. No measles outbreaks this year. None. None. Yes. No need. Yes. <laughs> Not a. <laughs> well, Dr. Mill, we're going to get out of here. All right. All right. Well, we'll see you back pretty soon. Thank you so much. So now we're going to get into our show. We all know that there are disproportionate rates of cancer in communities of color. There are multiple reasons why, but we're going to dis um, specifically explore one on our show today. The harmful chemicals that we voluntarily, but often unknowingly, put into our bodies or even on our bodies. Yes, this is a thing. And it's a thing that unfortunately is leading to poorer health and even death in some cases. But you know what? Thankfully, there are people out there who are devoted to shining a light on these chemical exposures that we unknowingly have to help you make informed choices for yourself, your family, and even your community. And we have one of those individuals with us today, Kaylee Bynes. She's a senior scientist at the Environmental Working Group and with over eight years of experience as an, uh, with an MPH in environmental health sciences, a BS in environmental biology, Kaylee focuses on how our environments can affect human health. She's passionate about improving public health through education, through policy and community empowerment. Welcome, Kaylee. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. I'm really glad to be here. Wonderful. Well, let's just jump right into it. What does the Environmental Working Group do? So the Environmental Working Group, or EWG, as we're also known, is a nonprofit that was founded in 1993, so almost 30 years of our work so far. Um, and we were focused on education and empowerment around issues of environmental health with a focus on chemical exposures. So we have a team of scientists that publish and stay on top of the latest scientific research and maintain and create our public databases. So um, some of our tap water databases, our consumer products databases, our food guides, um, we also have a government affairs team that works to improve legislation around these issues uh, at the state and the federal level. Well, that's quite a lot. And so, you know, I know a lot of our listeners and nationwide heard about that recent study that was published about chemical hair products, uh, relaxers, dyes, etc., that increase the risk of hormone related cancers like uterine cancer, ovarian cancer and breast cancer. We actually even talked about it a couple of weeks ago on Excuse Me Doctor on our weekly recap. So can you explain what that study was about and what are the chemicals that they're talking about? Yes, so this is a really important study. It was just published in August, 2022. Um, it came from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in North Carolina. So a really great source uh, for this type of information. And so this specific study, um, it was based on what's called the sister study. So a cohort of women who had sisters that had breast cancer, but they themselves did not have breast cancer. And so it's been used to study a bunch of different chemical exposures and different health outcomes for this group. And this particular particular study asked these women to report uh, their hair product use and then followed them up to see if they developed cancer. Um, and so specifically what they found in the study is that women who reported ever having used chemical hair straightening products compared with women who had reported never having used these products had twice the rate, uh, the risk of developing cancer, wow. uterine cancer specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, so did it matter how long they had used the products for? Like you just used it once and you were, your risk was increased or did they see a pattern in terms of the, the duration of the time? 
So they did look also at frequency of use, um, and that was a slightly less of a risk if you used it more frequently than less frequently. But really, the main finding of the study was comparing ever having used it to never having used it. Um, and one of the uh, chemicals that they identified as a potential problem is formaldehyde or formaldehyde releasing chemicals. So chemicals that aren't formaldehyde themselves, but can break down into formaldehyde um, as they stay in products. And so formaldehyde itself is a carcinogen. It's a confirmed carcinogen it can affect your DNA. Um, it's in a lot of these products, especially Brazilian blowouts has been getting a lot of attention right now. Um, and it could potentially also be an endocrine disrupting chemical or EDC or endocrine disruptor. Um, and so that is a group of chemicals that can affect your endocrine system. So your endocrine system is anything that has mediated by hormones. So anything in your entire body that is regulated by hormones, which is pretty much everything, uh, can be affected by these type of chemicals. And so that's why it's so concerning beyond just the uterine cancer, there are potential other effects as well. Right. And just so people know, examples of hormones are insulin, right? Um, that helps regulate our blood sugar, our thyroid hormones that help to regulate our uh, metabolism, how fast we burn and produce energy. And then um, our sex hormones, of course, which are probably the most famous, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so those are testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, etc. So this is really disturbing, like you said, because hormones basically control the way that our, our bodies uh, process everything. What are some other places that we might be exposed to endocrine disrupting hormones? Sure. So there are thousands of these chemicals, the EDCs or endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, and unfortunately, almost as many ways to be exposed to them. Uh, something that we at EWG specifically focus on are personal care products and consumer products in general. And so I think what I like to make the distinction between is um, hormone disruptors or endocrine disruptors that people are purposefully taking, like medications, steroids for autoimmune disorders, birth control, things of that nature. It's overseen by a doctor. You know how much you're taking. It's purposeful, right? But when these chemicals are being added to all of these products that we're using, we don't necessarily know that they're in there. You go to a store, you think, oh, this must be safe. It's being sold in this store. Um, and you buy it and you use it. And no one is paying attention to how much of this chemical or these chemicals you might be getting. Uh, there's nowhere to report your side effects like there would be for a medication. Um, and so you're potentially getting exposed to all of these. Um, one of our major products is in cosmetics and in personal care. So that's everything, lotions, shampoos, makeups. Um, we also have a cleaning program. So home cleaners, you know, sprays and other things that would, you would use to clean your home. Um, and our food databases. So food additives, preservatives, things of that nature. So it's unfortunately mm -hmm. very widespread. So if people wanted more information, because I know, you know, you mentioned one particular <clears throat> product, but if people wanted information about where they, you know, what sorts of products they need to stay away from, where should they go? Sure. So there are a number of sources. Um, we have authoritative bodies. So the European chemicals uh, regulations, we do go through them. We go through some industry um, studies. So the cosmetic ingredient review, for example, and just generally uh, domestically and abroad, what chemicals have been uh, either reviewed or regulated in other countries. Uh, we know that, you know, I'm not a government affairs person. We have a whole team for that. But we do know that there are other countries that have stronger legislation for these mm -hmm. chemicals and also states that have stronger uh, legislation for these chemicals. So we have a number of data sources to compile all of that, basically, so you don't have to. Right. So so me as a consumer, how can I do I go to the EWG's website or what do I do? Yes. So uh, if you search EWG Skin Deep or e EWG Guide to Healthy Cleaners, uh, those are our two main databases. And within that, there's a search function to search for ingredients or for specific uh, product types or even for a specific product. So you can find all of the information right there on our webpage. Fantastic. Now, we talked about endocrine disruptors for women, specifically um, ones that affect the, the sexual reproductive system. What about for men? Are there chemicals that can also affect, uh, you know, endocrine disruptors that affect men? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, exposure to endocrine disruptors can affect everyone's health. 
Um, for men in particular, I think one of the important parts of this conversation is that they not be left out. I think when there's such an emphasis on personal care and on the beauty industry, a lot of times it skews very quickly towards women. But this is something that men are using too. You know, men use lotion, men use deodorant. Um, and this is something that hair, they're also- Hair dyes. Exactly. Yeah. And this is that's something that they're being exposed to too. Um, and so unfortunately, specifically, you've seen uh, recent studies on male fertility. Um, there's a study in 2017 that came out of Israel that showed that there's been a 50% decrease in number of sperm or sperm count uh, in men since the 1970s. And so we're really trying to figure out why that is. And so people in my field think that it's because of our environmental exposures. Uh, there was a 2020 study that found that endocrine disrupting chemicals specifically uh, interrupted the development of Leydig cells, so the cells that actually produce the testosterone. And without mm -hmm. enough testosterone, obviously, you can't produce enough sperm. Um, and right. so fertility really comes into question. And actually, notably, a men's health article published this past August specifically focused on Black men and factors that are impacting their fertility, including that exposure to EDCs. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, just that incredible drop in fertility is, is staggering. Now, you know, we also featured on um, Excuse Me Doctor the last two weeks, uh, we've talked about food and the work that EWG has done uh, around, you know, what's happening in terms of pesticides and chemicals in our food. We highlighted the Safe 15, the um, produce that you can buy that, you know, you don't have to worry about it necessarily being organic because there are lower levels of chemicals and pesticides. And then the toxic 12, uh, the ones that you should avoid um, and make sure that you're buying organic when you buy them. So how are you able to come up with these classif classifications for what to buy organic and what other information can you tell us about? Sure. So I don't work directly on a lot of our food research. <clears throat> Excuse me at the moment, um, but I can explain a bit about what goes into that and what our team is doing. So specifically, we have EWG's Shopper's Guide to Pesticides and Produce. And within that, we have uh, what we like to call the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, um, kind of catchy ways to, to get to know this information. And so USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, um, and FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, regularly test 46 popular fruits and vegetables after they've already been prepared for cooking. So after they've been washed, after they've been peeled if necessary, um, and publishes all those data. But you know, this is a massive compilation of data and people don't necessarily have the time to go sifting through all of that. And so what EWG does is make it more digestible for people. Um, and so- No pun intended, these, right? No pun intended. <laughs> we create these lists, um, <clears throat> excuse me, cold season. We create mm -hmm. these lists, um, that have both the dirty dozen, which are the 12 that have the higher uh, numbers or um, um, counts of pesticides and the clean 15. So what we're really looking at is both the overall number of pesticides that we find within one sample. So if you know there are four different pesticides within a vegetable um, or fruit, and also the amount. So if there are high levels of just one or maybe two pesticides, and then we uh, separate it accordingly. So the dirty dozen are the ones that tend to have both higher pesticides and higher numbers of pesticides. And so, and that's after it's already been washed. And so that's why we really um, try to stress that if you're able, buying organic uh, for those 12 is really important. Um, comparatively, the clean 15 are ones that are lower in pesticides and you know maybe organic is not really in the budget. Maybe you can't always go for organic uh, in every circumstance and those would be the ones that are a bit safer to pick. Um, right. I also just like to talk about the fact that diversity in diet is really important. So I think sometimes when we talk about these lists, people get really nervous. You know, I can't afford um, organic spinach, but it's on the list and I'm getting nervous. I had a friend reach out about that actually. And I totally understandable. Um, and I think that it's just important to diversify. So maybe, you know, you see spinach on this list, you can't buy the organic spinach, but maybe you don't eat spinach every single day. Maybe, you know, you right. pick things from the Clean 15 to kind of shake things up a little bit and make sure you're not getting concentrated toxins from just one place. Yeah. You know, what's amazing when you think about diversity, we... people highest level of health are ones who eat at least 30 different kinds of fruits and vegetables each week. 
And so that diversity is so key. And one of the other things we also talked about when we talked about the Dirty Dozen was ways to clean your produce, right? In terms of using vinegar and water dilution or baking soda and water dilution, because soaking your produce in that actually helps to get any additional chemicals and pesticides off if you if you can't afford to buy organic. So yeah, yeah, thank you for mentioning that diversity. So key, eat the rainbow. Um, so we've talked about, you know, the chemicals uh, that are these endocrine disruptors that are found in these personal care products, as well as um, these pesticides and chemicals in our foods. What other kinds of harm can they do to our body besides increasing rates of cancer? Is there any link to obesity? So uh, short answer is yes. Long answer is a bit more complex. Um, so to go back to our discussion at the beginning, <clears throat> Where endocrine disruptors, because they're affecting anything that's hormone regulated, which is basically your entire body, there are so many outcomes that they can affect. And so in some cases, you're, you'll hear uh, endocrine disruptors, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, you'll hear endocrine disruptors be referred to as obesogens. I don't love that term. Um, I prefer the term metabolic disruptors, um, but the, the end point is the same, is that the fact that they are impacting the way that your body metabolizes foods. And so um, we don't know exactly what that looks like long-term and, and what that really means. Uh, it's definitely something that's still being studied scientifically. Um, we've written a couple blogs about this if people are interested in more information on our website, but you see things you know, from food additives uh, and other sources as well. And again, going back to the point about eating the rainbow and, and the diversity, this also uh, is important because it's just one part of your health, right? So I obviously am really passionate about chemical exposures, but that's not the only source of health issues. And so in talking about obesity and talking about weight, um, it's important to think of this as just one factor of many sure. um, when people are addressing this part of their health. Sure. And then you mentioned that men's health article that addressed uh, black men and their fertility. Is it that, do we see a connection between the rates of exposure to these harmful chemicals being higher in communities of color? We do, unfortunately. So specifically, if we're talking about personal care products, a 2015 report that we put out found that products mar marketed to black women in particular had more hazardous chemicals than uh, products marketed to the general public. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is that occupational exposures and exposures from neighborhood and zoning laws that put incinerators and waste dumps and other things in neighborhoods are just adding this chemical burden to communities of color, specifically black communities. And so it's, it's known as a form of systemic racism, specifically environmental racism. Uh, and Harriet Washington writes about that in her book, A Terrible Thing to Waste, that she published in 2019. Yeah. Um, but it's basically, it builds off of Dr. Robert Bullard, the, the father of environmental justice, as he's known, uh, his work in applying justice paradigms to environmental health. So what are these chemical exposures that communities of color are seeing and why? Um, and why do we need to address it in a way that actually prioritizes communities of color because of this undue, undue burden that they're facing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I could, I have a thousand more questions for you, but... <laughs> We have to bring back in Bria and Wayne, who are going to bring us, you know, the word from the street, the questions out there that I know are burning on everybody's mind. <laughs> Welcome back, Bria and Wayne. What do you in have for us? Incredible discussion. We have really good. we we have uh, some questions out there, but I'm going to let Bria go first. Go, Bria. Yes. So first question is from Lola Smith. Um, what ingredients should we look out for on hair products when trying to reduce our risk of cancer since many of them break down into formaldehyde, right? That's correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, and I think the challenging part of this question is that it, there's not even just one specific chemical uh, that is going to cause all of these issues. You know, there of endocrine disruptors, there are something like 4,500 of them that are known at this point. Um, and there are giant groups of them, like all the parabens, all the phthalates, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to limit it just to one specific chemical. Um, but I will say that the way that we work in our database is to individually 
assess all of these chemicals and then give an overall product score. Um, so I would say that I would recommend um, listeners and also myself as a consumer uh, to use our Skin Deep database. Really do um, look up your products and there or products that you're interested in using and see how they score, see how they compare. If, if you have one hair dye that is scoring a lot better, a lot lower than another, you might consider using that one instead. I think it's really important to talk about consumer choice because so much um, of this conversation kind of seems like a Debbie Downer, really depressing and overwhelming. Um, but you do actually have options here. And by choosing these safer products, these lower chemicals or less hazardous chemicals, you're showing in industry, this is what we want. We want these cleaner products and we want you to make these cleaner products. And we've actually seen more and more companies coming to us for help joining our program um, to make these cleaner products because they know that was what consumers want. So not only are you picking things that are safer for you and for your family, you're also actually protecting your whole community by making these more available to people. Mm -hmm. That's wow. good to know. Actually, if I could just jump on, on, on the back of that, I'm wondering from a chemical hair relaxer, which I know a lot of black women use, are there safe ones in your database? And is there any kind of uh, awareness that's to, uh, or efforts to heighten the awareness among stylists, um, hairstylists about that? Sure. So there are relaxers in our database. Um, we don't verify, which is our, our labeling program when we partner with these companies. We don't verify um, relaxers because so far we haven't found any that can actually uh, meet our criteria for health and safety. Um, I want everybody are, to hear that. <laughs> the ones that are in our database, um, they don't score very well. We consider our green scores, which are ones or our twos, to be um, the safest. And these are usually at least a four, um, if not much higher than that. Um, and so there are you know, safer options using a four versus using a 10. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have any that score in that really safe green range, unfortunately. Wow. Uh, staggering. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to you, Bri and Wayne. Just had to get that in there. My mic is, wasn't on. Wow, that's incredible. You have yeah. to know. Um, we have a question from uh, William Smalls. He writes, with, with a lot of uh, young people, young men, buying clothes offline, off IG, uh, he read that uh, a company called Shein or Shine, I don't know how you pronounce it. Shein. Uh, Shein, Shein, see, I don't, <laughs> I don't buy clothes off IG. So he, he writes that uh, they've been known to have more toxins in their clothes and he thinks they come from China. Are there any more co countries uh, where there are more toxins being imported than others? So I don't know specifically about countries, but I think it also goes back to regulation. So even in the US, you know, you have to look at who's actually regulating these products that are coming to market. So we see with personal care that it's really outdated. You know, no one's really looking at things before they make it to shelves. Um, you're just getting exposed and asking questions later. Um, and kind of the same thing happens with clothing. You know, there's not a lot of oversight there um, to the extent that I'm familiar with the industry. We actually are, EWG is sending uh, clothing samples to labs to get tested for certain chemicals, um, specifically PFAS chemicals right now, uh, per and polyfluoral alcohol substances. <laughs> but they're, um, this class of chemicals that's getting a lot of attention right now because while well, they are endocrine disruptors, like the ones we're talking about, um, and they cause other health issues as well. Um, and so it, it is a really big concern there. I, you know, I don't wanna get too, like I said, too into the negativity, but there are a lot of potential exposures um, for this. And that's why I think picking things where we can, um, mm -hmm. where we are educated about things can really be helpful because it's not about completely eliminating every exposure, but it's about reducing it where you can to make those differences for yourself. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and give you a next question. Um, and this is kind of based off the whole regulations and what is regulated, kind of what you were just talking about. Um, this is from Carolyn Jackson. And the question reads, um, curious to know if you have any insight as to why there are less regulation on products in the U.S. as compared to other countries. Yes. Um, so... 
in a very like high level part of this, I'm sure our government affairs team would have even more to, to add. Um, basically, it has to do with how products get to market, what testing is required. Uh, a lot of things in the U.S. are grandfathered in. Um, and so if they already were on the market, there's an assumption that, well, they must be safe because people are already using them. Uh, and that's not the case for every country. Additionally, we have the FDCA, the Food and Drug Co and Cosmetics Act, um, which basically is what gives FDA all of their uh, ability to regulate these products. Um, and there are enormous loopholes for cosmetics um, and for supplements and really all of these different things that we're being exposed to. Um, and there's just not strong enough like legislation um, and they don't do, uh, we would say at EWG, um, you know, as much as they could be doing to regulate some of these products. Uh, I will say our government affairs team has been asking FDA to regulate formaldehyde um, in products for quite a while. Um, we, they have moved forward on a risk assessment, which is great, uh, but not enough. Just identifying a risk is not getting it off the shelves. Uh, so we would like to see some more movement there. Mm. So wait, just to clarify, once products are grandfathered in, they aren't checked again after that? So it depends on the type of checking. Nobody is really doing the testing. It's a lot of the industry policing itself. Um, obviously, if you're coming up with a product that's so toxic, people are having huge health issues to it, um, either that's going to get reported to the federal government and they'll investigate um, or, you know, people will stop using it and the company will have a, a recall or something like that. But it is very industry driven. So, you know, if there are these more complex chemicals like endocrine disruptors where we're not exactly sure how much of a certain chemical is needed to cause a certain outcome or you're getting exposed to how many chemicals, how could you possibly know this is my product, things like that. Um, that really gets complicated and it, it just kind of gives up all of our control to these companies making the products. So if their, their company is making good decisions, great. If their company is making less good decisions, I always like to say that, um, you know, marketing claims are cheaper than testing data. So you can say your product's great, but we don't know that. Wow. Yeah. And it's the, it's the cumulative exposure that adds up over time, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like you use one product and you feel sick right away. Mm -hmm. And right. so it's probably hard to track all that over time. Mm -hmm. So We have a lot of the same questions and I'll, I'll narrow it down in the chat. And it's basically, how can we avoid plastics? They seem to be everywhere. Sure. So unfortunately, you're right. They are everywhere. Um, they're in a lot of places. I think mm -hmm. um, the hard part about it is that we're really going to need an industry response on this or a policy response on this. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting and advocating for that, um, I like to do two things. One is I like to look at the actual packaging um, or containers. So I try to go for glass if possible, um, sometimes metal, although metal can sometimes have small uh, layers of plastic on the inside to stop corrosion. Um, so you might still get some exposure there. I also like to um, look at the labels on the um, actual packaging. So sometimes they'll say things like no parabens or phthalate free, uh, no BPA, no BPS, things like that. The hard part there is again, this is you're relying on the company to be telling you this information. There's not a lot of oversight there. Um, so you hope that it's accurate, but those claims are not the same for every single company. Some of them saying no phthalates might mean no phthalates they intentionally put in, but maybe there's some contamination. Another company could say no phthalates and they actually mean no phthalates over a certain amount of phthalates. So, you know, it's, it's hard. And I think that's why it really needs a holistic approach through policy. Sounds like the wild, wild west. <laughs> I know, I know one thing we, that we've done is we've gotten rid of all our plastic storage containers and bought glass com containers. So, yeah, that's that's one thing you can do in mason jars as well. Yeah. But with mason jars, you have to buy new lids every time. Right. Wow. Yeah. Because so. they, they, they corrode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and kind of on that topic of, I guess, mitigating the risks, um, a question from, let's see if you get their name correctly, Siobhan Williams, how can we continue to mitigate our risks to these different chemicals and exposures? Sure. So I also want to just keep emphasizing that it's it's about as much as you can do. So as much as you can reduce in different parts of your life is great. I don't want anyone to come away with the idea that, oh, I can't get rid of all of this. It's everywhere. You know, it's 
getting rid of your exposure, as um, Dr. Clark said about cumulative risk, it's all of these exposures adding up. So if you can get rid of your risk in some areas, that's great. Um, and so it really comes down to me and for my work, um, product choice. So for your personal care products, picking these products that are safer, for your cleaning products, picking products that are safer. Um, I, you know, other parts of our teams, I don't work as much on it, but drinking water is huge. People talk about, um, you know, having filtered water, knowing what's in your water. Sometimes you'll live in municipalities that will report that to you, other times not. Um, so just trying to make consumer choices where you have that information uh, is really going to make a difference. And, and I also just want to piggyback on that, that, you know, our bodies are designed for wellness. We have an immune system. We have a system in our uh, body that detoxifies us, right? Um, and the more that you can do to help it, the more that your body will be able to eliminate some of these chemicals. And the, of course, the fewer chemicals you're, li you're exposed to, the better. But then that gives your body a chance to get rid of the few that you're um, uh, exposed to rather than being overwhelmed by it. And so eating nutritious foods, drinking water, staying well hydrated, getting enough sleep every night, um, moving, and reducing stress, the five self-health actions, actions that I always talk about, help your body be at its peak in terms of being able to process and get rid of these chemicals from your body when you are exposed. So it's not a doom and gloom thing. It's just like Kaylee said, you know, just limiting your exposure so that your body has a fighting chance to deal with the ones that you are exposed to. So any other questions? Yeah, one last question. I have, and it comes from me. Is it the last <laughs> question? It comes from me. I think so, yeah. Tell us about your holiday guide. Oh, sure. Uh, so this is just something fun that we put together. Um, we do it every winter. Um, it's actually staff sourced. So we have it up on our website right now. If you look up 2022 EWG holiday guide, um, and it's just basically all of the staff comes together and shares their uh, personal products that they really like. So, um, you know, household items, books, uh, clothing, anything like that. Um, and then our comms team compiles all of it and works with our science team to make sure all of it kind of meets our standards uh, for what we want to suggest to people. Um, and then we'll publish it so people can kind of see what things that we're interested in doing. So it's just something fun. It's something that we enjoy uh, pulling together. We have other guides on our website, um, like our shopper's guide that has the pesticide information, our water databases, other things like that, that are a little bit more serious. The shopping guide uh, is just for fun. It's something that, you know, if you need some ideas that are eco-friendly or human health friendly, uh, it's a place that you can find them. That's wow. helpful. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Great place, I guess, to go um, holiday shopping too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, this has been incredible. Thank you so much, Kaylee. That has been a wealth of information. I, for one, I'm going to go into my bathroom as soon as we get off the show. I'm going to go one by one through my products mm -hmm. and go to your <laughs> website and start entering them each in and figuring out which ones I'm going to be throwing out today. Mm -hmm. And uh, then which one, what I need to replace them all with. So yeah. thank you so much. This has been just an incredible wealth of knowledge. And I'm no course, longer shopping on IG for clothes either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be the move. Yes. Yeah. Thank or you at so least, much, at least, yeah, at uh, least go through you. the da database. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Kaylee, go ahead. No, no, just thank you so much for having us um, on here. We'd love to be able to get our work out there. Um, and so opportunities like this just are so meaningful for us to get um, our message out and to get our resources out. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And of course, thanks, Bria and Wayne, for bringing us the word from the street, all those mm -hmm. wonderful uh, questions. And uh, as always, before I go, I want to remind everybody that you, as part of my Be Health Empowered audience, can participate if you want in a study at Howard University. It's about COVID resilience, how you have been coping through this pandemic. That's what it's all about. All you have to do is fill out two surveys, just two, and you have the opportunity to be reimbursed up to $100 for your participation in the form of two gift cards that will be mailed to you. So if you have any interest in that whatsoever, email Dana Harvey. Her email is up there, Dana, D-A-N-A-H-A-R-V-E-Y, the Harvey Research 
at gmail.com. Dana Harvey research at gmail.com. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for your fantastic questions. Thank you so much for uh, hitting that like and hitting that subscribe. If you're on YouTube or on Facebook, really appreciate you for it. And until I see you again, remember, be wise, be well, and be health empowered. So I guess I should thank the Robinsons. They invited me. They still don't know. I hooked up with Dave three days ago. He'll start coughing tomorrow. And I bet in 10 days he'll be on a ventilator. Now his wife, she's not vaccinated because she thinks it'll prevent her from being pregnant. But what they don't know is, is that I can decrease sperm count. Sorry, Dave. Good luck with that. <laughs>